Today we're going to be looking at another one of Veritasium's videos. Specifically, the Rods from God, which he says is the U.S. military's worst idea. I don't know. The U.S. military has had a lot of really bad ideas. Using nukes to dig holes, so this one must be pretty bad. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Tyler Fols. I'm a nuclear engineer with a little over 10 years of experience in the commercial nuclear power industry. From engineering operations to emergency response. I don't claim to know everything there is nuclear, but I can certainly share some knowledge. Let's check this out. This is the biggest, most ambitious, most expensive video I've ever made, and it's also gonna be terrifying. Whoa. We are strapping these giant metal weights to the belly of that helicopter, flying it up several kilometers in the sky, and then dropping these weights on a sand castle city. What? <laughs> so the idea is just dropping is just gravity bombing from helicopters, dropping things on people's heads, I guess? Huh. I mean, we need... In Sputnik. the late 1950s, the United States had a problem. The Soviet Union launched the first artificial satellite, Sputnik, into orbit around the Earth on the 4th of October 1957. But Space less race. well known is that just over a month earlier, they successfully tested the first intercontinental ballistic missile, or ICBM. It could deliver a nuclear warhead from the Soviet Union to cities on the US East Coast in around 30 minutes. They didn't test it with a real nuclear warhead, but yeah. ICBMs changing nuclear doctrine rather than a fleet of bombers or relying solely on a fleet of bombers. You can have rockets that could hit everywhere. Facing this threat, a researcher at Boeing named Jerry Purnell came up with an idea for a space weapon. It could hit any location on Earth in half that time, just 15 minutes. It could destroy targets buried 30 meters underground, like the silos where the Soviet nukes were kept, and theoretically, it could intercept ICBMs mid-flight. His concept was to put telephone pole-sized pieces of tungsten in space, in orbit. So okay, I can see the idea behind tungsten. Tungsten's very hardy and very dense. So I think I see where he's going there with the, the helicopter, I guess, flechette type bombs. All right, so they're going to drop something from something really high up. Also, we need to be able to resist re-entry. Tungsten would be a good mater better material to use compared to, say, iron or steel. These pieces of tungsten could drop on a target basically at any time. The idea was within a 15 minute window, you would be able to release one of these tungsten rods and have it re-enter the atmosphere and strike a target in minutes. Not precise, And it would come in so fast. You know, in orbit, things go about eight kilometers per second. And as it enters the atmosphere, it's gonna slow down due to the atmospheric drag, but still on impact, it's still gonna be going like 10 times the speed of sound, Mach 10, or about three kilometers per second. That's fast. This is MOAB, which stands for Massive Ordnance Air Blast, but it's more or commonly more referred bombs. to by its nickname, the mother of all bombs. It is one of the most powerful non-nuclear explosives on the planet. When it detonated, it released the equivalent of 11 tons of TNT. Now just That's one of these tungsten rods coming in would have the same energy as the largest conventional explosive ever detonated. They are not bombs. They contain no explosives. But the amount of energy, energy that they're carrying in device, their kinetic energy vehicle. because they are so heavy and they're going so fast, it is as big as any conventional bomb ever detonated. It's interesting is I've heard of weapons going the other direction, like the, it's called the THAAD missile that's designed to attack missiles and satellites. But there you're going from ground to space. Now what if one of those hits one of these rods from God? That would be, that would be interesting. <laughs> So this weapon is, I guess, designed for precision. If they're mentioned about hitting um, underground silos and bunkers, things like that. If you're just hitting like a regular building or something, you don't need to be close. But stuff that is buried and underground, you're going to be pretty close. 
Purnell called his weapon Project Thor, after the Norse god who threw lightning bolts from Thor. the heavens. In the 1980s, <laughs> the kinetic missile Norse, interceptor idea was seriously considered by the Reagan administration. It was codenamed so was Brilliant Pebbles, but the project <laughs> was abandoned. In 2003, it was resurrected by the Air Force Transformation Plan, which referred to this weapon as Hypervelocity Rod Bundles. But colloquially, the weapon is known as rods from God. Hypervelocity rod bundles. Interesting. Yeah, when I think of rods, at least in the context of nuclear, I think of them containing either fuel or there's control rods that you put next to the fuel rods in order to, to slow down a reaction. Fuel rods are control rods. Never heard of any idea of dropping them to Earth, though. I've heard the opposite of that, launching them into space, but that was what to do with nuclear fuel. Space uh, rocket launchers aren't exactly known for their near perfect probability of working, so you're better off just keeping them on Earth in dry cast storage where they are safe. Don't, wanna, don't want any nuclear material blanketing the atmosphere, depending on if the rocket got damaged or what have you. Plus, if you're going to do it with an actual dry cask, it's going to be a pretty heavy rocket because those things weigh upwards of 100 tons. The kinetic energy of an object is directly proportional to its mass and its velocity squared. So increasing That's the object's simple. mass 10 times increases its kinetic energy 10 times. But if Very you increase easy. the velocity by a factor of 10, the kinetic energy grows by a factor of 100. This is why even very light objects can carry lots of kinetic energy. Yep, very straightforward equation. Um, the opposite, actually, of dose near a radiation source. That one, this is a square law. The other one uses an inverse square law. So you double your distance from something that's radioactive. You're only going to get a quarter as much dose. So distance is a very important aspect in protecting yourself from radiation. Time, distance, and shielding. This is what a 15 gram piece of plastic does to a block of aluminum when traveling at six kilometers per second. Oh yeah, that's and fast. This is a real problem for satellites. Because of the massive speeds on orbit, micrometeorites, small bolts, or even flecks of paint are serious risks for the astronauts living on board the International Space Station. That's why you see things about alien spacecraft, considering they're tra traveling at at relativistic speeds, they have to be made of some super tough material or advanced shielding or what have you in order to travel going through space and not be an absolute wreck and just get completely destroyed because that grain of sand going at 99.999% the speed of light is going to destroy any conventional material, especially because it's so small, so it's doing so much damage to a relatively small area of the craft. One interesting thing, though, is when things are going that fast and have that much kinetic energy, they don't exactly have a tendency to stick together, which is why you're picking some super dense material like tungsten. This chip in the window of the ISS was caused by a tiny speck of dust, and a small piece of space junk punctured a hole in the robotic arm. Imagine yep. something that weighs 10 tons traveling that fast. Kinetic energy weapons appear in fiction, including dozens of movies, video games, and books. But how realistic are those. they? I mean, could this weapon ever become a reality? Well, that's why we're here in the middle of the desert. We want to see how damaging a rod from God could be. So they're doing like a scale And we really pulled test. out all the stops, even hiring a team of professional sandcastle builders to construct a city onto which we'll drop the rods. So a sandcastle city. Yeah, all the respect in the world. Oh, they got some wind. Are they going to hit anything? We are seven-time U.S. Open Sandcastle champions. <laughs> That's so cool. Sandcastle experts. It'll endure. Never would have guessed that, hey, we're going to test do a scale model of rods from God. I, I never would have guessed uh, hiring sandcastle experts. Engineers, physicists, sure, but... <laughs> so I guess to their credit, there is a fair amount of engineering involved in building sandcastles, so I don't, I'm not going to underestimate these guys. Test of the highest weight at the highest drop with very little damage. I'm really convinced of that. 
The U.S. Capitol was great. Yeah, isn't that great? <laughs> yeah. Wow. One of our I love all the buildings there. Who did the pickle? The gherkin. Yeah, yeah. the gherkin right here. Very nice. This is beautiful. I mean, I, I feel <laughs> bad for trying to trying to hit it. The problem I have with this, a few problems. Uh, you're not going to have that compressive shockwave effect of something going hypersonic. For those of you who don't know what hypersonic means, that's more than five times the speed of sound. And when you break the sound barrier, you're creating a shockwave. At five times, it's going to be such a turbulent, you're going to have super positioning of shockwaves. It's going to be a very, very destructive force. So with a scale model like this, is there anything they could even do to simulate that kind of destructive impact? Because it's more than just something hitting a target. It's something with a massive amount of waves and energy just going to completely destroy this fake sand city. <laughs> I'm questioning if that even scaling everything down, that math, I know they mentioned the kinetic energy equation, that, that square law, just that square law by itself isn't telling you the whole story because you're going to have, it's the atmospheric effects that are going to be so destructive. That's actually one of the most destructive aspects of nuclear weapons. Even if they're not traveling at a hypersonic, the, but the black, even if the missile or the bomb isn't hypersonic, say you're going old school with a World War II era nuke, the explosion will be, and those shock waves are going to destroy so many buildings. That's the most destructive aspect when it comes to a city or, or property damage. And it's one of the reasons why a lot of them are airburst is because that maximizes that effect. So how are they going to recreate this? I am just very concerned about aiming. The city is not that big. So before we get to that drop, we're going to try to hit this swimming pool. Yeah, what kind of precision instruments were they using? For 220 pound mass. Uh, probably go up about 500 meters, try to drop a weight right into this pool. I no, that's that's not gonna simulate the, that's basically just simulating dropping a rock on something. I mean, that's, that's not the same effect. I mean, you'll get to see the velocity squared at work, but none of these air compression effects is gonna work I don't think we're gonna hit it in fact my main concern for the whole day is that we're just not gonna be able to hit anything and then what was the point in coming out here <laughs> in the first place these are gonna be the questions that I ask myself so the way we're targeting is with GPS we're gonna take a GPS mark GPS, from like huh? the center of the pool oh boy we've also got GPS in the helicopter this seems very coarse we're use that to try to line up square over the middle of the pool like you're eyeballing it <laughs> So if we're able to hit this pool from 500 meters, then I think we've got a shot. Where's your GPS? My GPS is my phone. And I have the coordinates written I'm just gonna use it on your phone. <laughs> we're ready to go. <laughs> you wrote it on your arm. Uh, this seems like some cheesy backhand, uh, back of the envelope type, type calculations. And it's going to be hard to hit it with, with something like that. This actually kind of reminds me, this is like the more expensive version of experiments that like in a physics class in high school where you have a ball rolling down the hill and you have to try to get it to hit like some target on the ground that's like an inch across or a couple inches across or something like that. And there's some calculations done into it, but <laughs> seeing them do it on the arm, I mean, I, I could tell they're just being silly with this, but it makes me wonder if they're actually going to hit anything. The other question is how steady are they going to get this <laughs> chopper? Drop. And it's feeling shaky, I got to tell you. And they got to compensate for when? Oh, it's swinging. to be at uh, 1,500. Okay. I just don't know like why they're circling up that high. Is that 500 meters? That seems really high. It's actually slightly less because if they're talking 1,500 feet, that's that's not quite 500 meters. Yes, I'm being that guy. Feet, that seems higher than 1500 feet. That is freaking crazy. Okay. Here we go. This is the one. This is the one. 
It's swinging like crazy. They're making a pendulum. It's swinging around like crazy up there. Yeah, does Slow it have fin. fins on it? Jesus, no, no fins. <laughs> Why didn't we have this conversation a week ago? Is that Adam Savage from Mythbusters? <laughs> No, yeah, Finn, something to guide it would be good, because I'd imagine the real rods from God's gonna have some some form of targeting system. More than GPS, satellite, lasers. They probably don't have satellite, but they could at least put some use some lasers or something. That's good. We're good left to right, that's good. We just need to go forward. Oh jeez. That does not like they look like they're in position, right? Are you kidding me? I never will. There it goes. Oh my. What the, what is that gonna That's hit? That's going way off. Oh, it is going sideways. What did it hit? Way past the Oh jeez. That was way more off than I thought. Oh my God. I was right on. Was your show on the same thing back then? Yeah, we were. And it went sideways too. Okay, yeah, you're gonna need some fins. I mean, even like basic gravity bombs have some fins, so it, delivers. I mean, after all, terminal velocity is a function of surface area, so you want the thing to drop fast. You don't want it to be, to be, go like a log, be, to go like a spike rather than a log. And even if it's like a dart or a flechette or something, yeah. <laughs> Are they intentionally showing a goof just for like, they're showing the blooper reel grade one first or something? They might, they might show a better one. Let's see. Right on it. Yeah, good. Well, that's kind of weird. That's just going to show you what's going to happen at altitude. We both said we were right on it and they didn't even look remotely right on it. Come on. Also, for things like bombing, you compensate for, you know, the direction that the uh, that the vehicle is moving. And even if you're just sitting, you're not going to be perfectly level. I mean, I'm not an expert, but as someone who's at least been in a helicopter, you're not still. And even if you were, there's still the wind, the atmosphere to contend with. So, yeah, gonna, gonna need some guidance on this guy. It didn't look like you guys were moving, but... Yeah, he, he's telling me our horizontal velocity was zero. And you were in the right spot. We were exactly in the right spot. Oh, wow. What about the wind? <laughs> oh, wow. Look at that. Oh, wow. Totally, totally buried. In the dirt. Falling from 500 meters, the rod accelerated for 10 seconds. And even accounting for air resistance, it hit the ground going about 350 kilometers per hour. At that speed, with a mass of 100 kilograms, it was carrying nearly half a million joules of kinetic energy. Joule is a very small unit of energy. Using another unit, a kilowatt hour. Now granted, that thing hits you in the head, it's still gonna kill you, but it's nothing compared to the effects. Even scaled down, it's, it's nothing compared to the effects of large explosives. Put another way, in joules, one kilowatt hour, a very small unit of energy used to power your house, is 3.6 million joules. So, yeah. This won't, this won't make a blip on your monthly electric bill. Our plan for the day is to drop something twice as heavy from six times higher. Then its energy okay. on impact will be greater than the explosion of a kilogram of TNT. Kinetic impacts are explosive. Sure, I mean, I, I buy that. Yeah, you're making the distance, so the, so the velocity is gonna be much higher, the mass is gonna be higher, but let's, uh, let's work on your targeting first there. <laughs> If you look at the craters on the moon and you look really closely, you're gonna see that they're basically all circles. I think no one stops to ask, well, why are they circular? If you imagine when the moon gets hit Distribution by asteroids, of energy. they're gonna come in from all different directions. So shouldn't you get these sort of oblong shapes where the asteroid comes in? Well, the truth is the asteroids come in with such incredible speed that it's not like they're pushing dirt out of the way and that's what creates the crater. So you just said that that's more of a point of that this scale thing just doesn't just doesn't work because he's talking about high velocity impacts and at low and he's using a low velocity something that is just going to be something hitting the dirt. So that kind of I mean, I like what he's doing. It's a fun experiment, but as far as a simulation of anything like the rods from God, it's just not gonna work, and he just said that. No, they're coming in so fast that when they collide, their kinetic energy is explosive. It, it heats up the ground, mm -hmm. turns things into liquid and gas. They all get super hot, and they spray outwards in a giant explosion. 
Now, this explosion you're going to see on the moon is way less dramatic because there's no atmosphere, there's no, there's no oxygen, nothing will ignite. So you're just going to see a lot of dirt. I mean, it's going to be explosive in the sense of things being rapidly accelerated from each other, but you're not going to see like a fireball that you would see if these asteroids made, made impact on Earth because there's nothing really to catch fire. This explosion is symmetric. It doesn't matter which That's angle or right. how shallow the asteroid was coming in. It's going to blow out everything radially because it is explosive. Kinetic energy is explosive. And the word explosive is me, correct. Just, just really don't think fireball. Thing. It would be the exact same thing with dropping these rods going Mach 10 when they hit a target. They're going to create an explosion as though they are the largest conventional weapon ever launched. These are going to be some fire. And because it's going so fast, it can penetrate around 30 meters of soil, enough to bust bunkers or silos. And the explosion is therefore some of them. There are some there are some crazy structures that are that are even deeper than that. But it'll yeah, it'll hit things that are things like super deep bore mines They can go deeper than 30 meters more localized so it can be used for precise surgical strikes. Plus, unlike a nuclear Hopefully weapon, there's no radioactive targeting. fallout to worry about or international laws. <laughs> That's true. Uh, no radioactive fallout unless you, again, do something silly like uh, take spent fuel assemblies up there. They're going to be dense, but they're not they're not tungsten, but it's not going to create the amount of fallout you'd see from a nuclear weapon simply because there's not that much there, but it it's still going to be nasty and I don't actually know if that part would violate the outer space treaty since it's technically not a nuclear weapon. So, using undeclared special nuclear material in space cuz that, that's what it would be considered special nuclear material stuff that could theoretically be used to make a nuclear bomb, so you're going to break all of those things. But as far as the Outer Space Treaty, I don't actually know, because <laughs> it, it doesn't really uh, specify that. Do these ideas contravene any current laws or treaties? No, the only um, international agreement there is about putting weapons in space is about nuclear weapons. Wait, that's not what this thing says. It says carrying nuclear weapons or other kinds of weapons of mass destruction, which if you're using the weapons of mass destruction from 2000s Bush era politics, where that was used to talk about chemical and biological weapons that uh, Saddam Hussein allegedly had, I wonder if these rods from God would, because you have enough of them, you could cause quote unquote mass destruction. They're definitely not nuclear weapons, but I wonder about that. I, some people probably would view these as weapons of mass destruction. Would they have been viewed as that in 1963? Maybe not, but I don't know. That's at weapons of mass destruction. People could hang their hat on that. What do you think? The only real prohibition is, is about putting nuclear weapons in space. It's not what that piece of paper Man, says. Like, I thought targets would be hard to hit. Now I'm like super convinced they're impossible. <laughs> what we're gonna do it's not impossible. Stable, compensate for wind, which I mean, you know that a helicopter is going to have any sort of wind speed indicator. Use some fins, use better targeting. It's not impossible. Technically, it is possible to hit it with something even with the, the silly technique they did earlier, but let's see if they try something better. We're gonna do a much lower altitude and we're gonna do it visually. Yeah, So Great. we're gonna do it, you know, 300 feet visually. I love it. I'm gonna do a cube drop. A cube drop? 300 feet visually, I mean, even visually at 300 feet, even visually at 300 feet, there's still gonna be some small effects from wind. I mean, they should be able to get it in the pool though if they're dead center. It's interesting because I was like, we shouldn't do a cube drop. We're here talking about rods of God, they're cylinders, right? Now I'm so thankful we have the cubes because the, the cube ain't gonna land sideways because it's a cube. Adam Savage told me. Cylinders tend to fall on their sides if given enough chance. Really? Who would have thought? I would have thought like, you know. I mean, that's not, that's not hard to think about though because that's where the majority things just have a tendency to topple over even when they're falling. I don't know. I'm not sure why that's difficult. Am, am I missing something here? Is there a misconception out there? Because that seemed that seemed kind of obvious. And that's again why you have why you have fins. A pencil type thing. It would it would tend to. Another thing the fins would do would prevent it from like toppling over multiple times. Straight down. That still looks high. Is that 100 meters? Cause that 30 second call. It doesn't look like they're over the pool. 
and it's swinging it's back totally and forth. It's, it's wild. Wind. It's totally swinging. Yeah, even with the choppers at zero velocity, um, that that doesn't mean the projectile is, because they're they're making a pendulum. GPS is spot on, and I see it right below. Yeah, you see it swinging back it and forth. High. We're on it. We're on it. They're getting closer we're off though. Like 60 feet. Yeah. Oh wow. Jeez. Did you look like we were right above it? Look like it, yeah. Wow. As I showed we were right on it as well. That's something from hundred meters. I'll take it. <laughs> oh man. Okay, we're this setting shouldn't up be to that. drop this mass, two hundred kilograms, four hundred and forty pounds. What do you think? Yeah, we're gonna get your... Are we gonna hit it this time? I hope so. This is not at all a simulation of Rods from God anymore. Now it's just a little... A little bit this of silliness. This is the moment of truth. We've had two misses so far. So we're going 50 meters or 150 feet pool. Also, why is it the me, worst idea? It's pretty disappointing. But at this point, I just want to hit is something. Is it just because it's destructive? In that case, nuclear weapons are a bad idea. They're very good at what they do. Oh boy. The weight is swinging around on there. They got some it's wind, I can hear it. getting blown around by the wind. I mean, we need luck. Or guidance. There it goes, there it goes, there it goes. Gonna hit this I'm turn? tracking, tracking. Splash! <laughs> Good job, guys. Yes! It hit something! Yes! It was like right on the edge. Good to see them hit it. Right on the edge. I don't want to poo-poo their ideas too much. This morning, I was so worried that we weren't going to hit anything. And like, I think the footage is so shaky because I was so excited. But like, <laughs> seeing that from above was amazing. Wow. Yeah, I messed it up that pool. right through the pool. That's crazy. Yeah. Unbelievable. Oh, look at the rubber duckies. Sir, so is the next target it's the sandcastle? It's a weight concentrated in that small surface meters? area. I want to double it. This will be amazing. If we can actually hit the sandcastle from 100 meters, that'll be something. In all the different incarnations of rods from God, the rods are made out of tungsten. And there are two reasons for this. The first is that tungsten dense. is really, really dense. A cubic meter of tungsten weighs 19 tons. That's over twice the density of steel, which is what we're using here, just because it's a lot cheaper. Yeah. But that means for a given amount of mass, tungsten rods could be less than half the volume of steel and therefore encounter less resistance as they pass through the atmosphere. And importantly for re-entry, mm -hmm. tungsten also has an incredibly high the, yep, melting that's the point, other bit. the highest of any metal Steel wouldn't at almost 3,500 degrees Celsius. This is important because as the rod decelerates through the atmosphere, a lot of heat builds up all around it. And tungsten's high melting point means the rods require much less shielding to prevent them from melting. That's true. The shape is also important. The goal is to hit the target with as much speed as possible, so a sleek, aerodynamic shape is best. And rods are a great shape for that. Aerodynamics is why arrows and bullets and ballistic missiles all look the way they do. It's to minimize drag. Note that all those examples he showed involved fins. <laughs> Honestly, one of the big mistakes we made was not welding fins onto our rods. Thank you. We're going up to about 100 meters or 300 feet before we drop. We're going to hit the Sandcastle City. That's the goal. Any minute. Any second. Sandcastle drop number one. There it goes. There it goes. There it goes. It's going. Did it hit in front? Just in front. It's just in front. We just missed it. We were close. We were really close. You're that close with the real one, you're going to destroy it. But again, you can't simulate these shockwaves, I guess. Tractor's going to dig the weight out right now. Yeah. Just pick it up. Go. That's Eight. how it landed. So close to taking out the capital. Yeah, look at that. Take out the capital. 
30 seconds to drop. God, that wind. 20 seconds. 20 seconds. That wind is brutal. Oh. Another thing is the wind velocity is actually just, re since they're going so slow relative to the, the real rods from God, it would, the wind is so much of a percentage effect on it just because of the impact. And rather than it tearing through some wind with some massive shock waves. But again, you'll, you'll still want to account for things just like you would with any sort of ballistics. Did they bring any ballistics experts with them? I know they got the sandcastle experts, but Adam oh, Savage boy. knows ballistics. Oh boy. Uh, hit something on the left, but I don't think it was the city. Couple buildings? Seeing nah, all the challenges we're going through reminds me just how difficult it is to aim a, a kinetic projectile. Ten, Ten seconds. seconds! Um, no. They, w they wouldn't have a lot of, the of these sort of problems, though. There's things you can do to adjust. There's targeting systems. You can adjust angles. They're just freehanding this. It's hard. I would say it's hard to aim one freehand, but I don't know how often that really happens unless you're just, you know, someone like shooting a bow and arrow. But the bow and arrow has fins on it. There it goes. Did they hit a building? They landed right in the middle and didn't hit anything. Wouldn't that be funny? What? 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 I cannot believe it. Direct hit on the building, but it only took down that side. <laughs> Find it you got some good sandcastle look guys here. Look there. at the cracks in the back. And like, it created cracks, but it didn't make the whole Didn't destroy the whole building. How to defend against rods This is grab. not what you would use if you wanted to cause mass devastation. This is like, if you wanted to, to pinpoint Use sandcastle experts. Now, if I'm honest, we did not manage to make a fair test of rods from God, even on a small scale. You know, I wanted to 200 kilograms from three kilometers, yeah. but aiming was so hard that we got nowhere near that. So we didn't get to see the explosive power of kinetic energy. When we made one last ditch attempt to drop again from 500 meters, I was just terrified that we were gonna hit something or someone. <laughs> yeah. Look out. I'm surprised I didn't bring this up. Earlier, what kind of safety precautions are these guys using when you're dropping stuff? Because normally I've never been to like an explosives range during a live field test or something, but there's all kinds of safety precautions. People are usually behind some sort of cover when you're testing missiles or whatnot, but I was just so <laughs> the, the absurdity is distracting me from bringing the uh, bringing up the safety minute, but yes. Be sure you are safe outside of anywhere within the delivery path of the projectile that is being dropped. Look out, look out, look out, look out. And he was right to call oh. it off. Oh. Oh. He was right to call it off if safety is brought into question. I was just happy to finish the day with everyone safe. I didn't shoot that because I was so terrified. Oh, I see it. Wow. Mm. You're right that it bounced out. Boeing. But given the amount of time and money we spent on this video, I would say it is my biggest failure of all time. Which, as it turns out, is also something you could say about the actual weapon, Rods from God. I mean, just start with aiming. Steering a rod from God is in theory possible. You could use thrusters or adjustable fins or change the rod's center of mass. But in practice, it's incredibly difficult to aim an object traveling at hypersonic speeds. Not only that, I mean, the Thad missile system has successfully shot down missiles before, so you can do it. I don't, I don't like what he's saying here, that just because of that and because it's hard, there is some, missile targeting is a crazy thing. That doesn't mean it's impossible or even a bad idea to try, so I, I don't agree with this. Communicating with the rod from the ground or from space would be nearly impossible due to the superheated plasma surrounding it. And there are other problems. You know, say you want to hit a target within 15 minutes. You'd think the simplest thing would be to put a rod right above the target in geostationary orbit. But geostationary orbit is over 35,000 kilometers away. That's almost a tenth the distance to the moon. So from there, a rod would take several hours to fall to the Earth. 
And if you put it in low Earth orbit, say around 350 kilometers above the Earth, the rod will move relative to the ground, doing a revolution around the Earth every 90 minutes. Everything with space travel, though, involves hypersonic moving vehicles and re-entry. All that, all that stuff is done, though. So, and it's been done since the 1960s and earlier. So, and we have way better targeting systems now than they did back then. So, I don't agree with this. I think maybe he just had a bad day with his test and he wants to vent. I'm, okay, let's, let's let him vent. So between ordering a strike and the rod hitting the target, that could take anywhere up to an hour and a half. Now you might think that you could get that time down to about 30 minutes by placing, say, 10 satellites in that orbit. But remember, the Earth rotates, so orbits drift. You would actually need hundreds of satellites to make sure there's always a rod close by the target. So let's say you want to put you have to be directly rods over it to hit space. something. Well, the cost of launching them will be billions of dollars. And over time, the thrusters will break down and malfunction, so there are going to be ongoing maintenance costs. But what if you just want to use it for missile defense? Well, then you don't need something that weighs 10 tons. A smaller rod would do. But even then, it's really, really tricky. And to successfully intercept an ICBM, you've got to hit it during the boost phase. Modern ICBMs split into a number of payloads after the boost, some of which are decoys to overwhelm anti-ICBM defense missiles. That's uh, multiple independently targeted re-entry vehicles. Yeah, those things are particularly nasty, but even after they split, you could still potentially hit them. It's just not... It's very hard to do, but, and you're better off getting it before he splits. I get what he's saying there. I don't know. The whole, it's probably not the best idea. There's some pretty questionable things the, the military has come up with. To stop North Korean ICBM launches, for example, the US would need around 400 rods spread among <laughs> eight orbits to be able to intercept missiles in time. A global defense system would require at least a few times that amount. And it's been calculated that even a very limited system would cost around $300 billion. That's really which is it. Nearly half of the US. Anything with anything with space borne weapons is just gonna get stupid expensive. Yeah, that that part I get. That part I get. Very annual budget. And even that wouldn't work, because enemies could evade the defense by launching several missiles at the same time. Since there's only one rod in the right location at any time, a rod could intercept one of the missiles, but you the could rest glide the rod somewhere through. else though, but there are so cheaper ways from to do God this. turns out to be unfeasible to execute in reality. After his stint at Boeing, Jerry Purnell, who came up with the idea, became a science fiction writer. And in his 1985 New York Times bestselling book, <laughs> Footfall, an alien race uses kinetic weapons to invade the Earth. And honestly, I'm pretty glad that this weapon is feasible only in science fiction. Sure. That one was pretty silly. I do really appreciate his attempt to do this sort of scale test, despite all of its obvious flaws. I don't agree with a lot of what he said about the unfeasibility, other than just the cost of space-borne weapons in general and ground missile defenses. Well, even though their accuracy isn't great either, it's cheaper to just use a bunch of them. So I buy that. What do you think of this? Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next time.